welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast, a podcast for creatives. I'm your host, Tammy Takeishi. Join me for compelling conversations with artists, actors, authors, musicians, and other creatives about the impact of the creative and fine arts in their lives and our ever-changing world. Thank you for listening. Welcome to another episode of Creative Peace Mill. I'm your host, Tammy. Today, I'm joined by Ami Kunumura. She is a music therapist and the founder of the Self-Care Institute, as well as a writer and a speaker. Ami provides therapeutic support for professionals around the world who are experiencing burnout. And she is the creator and facilitator of Resilience Over Burnout, a self-care program an in-depth online program that guides professionals out of burnout and stress cycles through research-based self-care practices. She is also the author of Resilience Over Burnout, a self-care guide for music therapy. And welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. It's exciting to have you here and to catch up. You know, we've known each other for a little while, but what I have not known is who or what inspired you to become a music therapist. Yeah, you know, and I like that the word inspired is in there because I think what inspired me to become a music therapist was actually a period of being uninspired. And it was 2001 was the year where I decided to become a music therapist. And um, 2001 was the year that September 11th happened. And that sort of pushed me into this like existential crisis and period of depression and you know I'm not saying 9-11 at all was inspiring neither was depression or, or an existential crisis but all of that was motivating for me to help me find what I really wanted to do in life my original plan was to be an optometrist and I sort of just had this plan that I was going along with in life it wasn't it was just sort of like I was doing it because I didn't know what else to do and when I heard about music therapy it's like this light went on in my heart and I thought wow that's combining music and psychology two of my favorite topics and I just felt like that's what I was meant to do but I do feel like that period of being uninspired was helpful for me to feel that contrast between, you know, what was me just kind of running on this, like, um, sort of like on this treadmill of life, like where I wasn't exactly choosing a path. And instead, I was able to get that contrast of no making a conscious choice by what what felt like a calling to my heart. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, we all seem to have our own journeys on how we get to music therapy and it it always seems like a winding path for everyone. Yes, yes, it is. And for me, it was a very windy path. It wasn't easy at the time. I could like barely play guitar when I decided to become a music therapist. Like I knew a few chords, but um, I had to learn how to be a musician. And when I started um, the music therapy program at Chapman University in Orange County, I I was at the same time taking private music lessons. And like, it felt like I was trying to catch up with everybody. And for me, that was hard because I'm used to, I'm overachieving type and, you know, used to being like the top of my class, but I had to work so hard. But again, I feel like that was necessary for my path because it also felt wonderful at the same time to feel this burst of motivation that was that drove me to um, pursue this and and complete it and get board certified. Great, great. And of course, you know your focus is on self care. How did you come to land on that? Yeah, so my focus on self-care came through my own experiences with occupational burnout. And, you know, it was only, I was two years into my music therapy career when I burnt out for the first time. And at first, I didn't really recognize it as burnout because I thought, I thought burnout happened to like 
older people who are like just kind of over their job or just really tired or didn't like their work for some reason I thought that so burnout was and so it was very confusing to me when I loved the work that I was doing I still felt inspired by it but at the same time it was draining me so much having that conflicting experience to me didn't first register my brain as oh I could be burning out I just felt like something was wrong with me and so it wasn't until you know I went and sought out therapy for myself and did you know some of my own self-exploration work and then learned about what burnout actually is that I was able to recognize it and then I realized I wasn't alone in this experience too and so when I got my master's degree in music therapy um, at St. Mary of the Woods College, um, I, went, I went back to school about eight years after I got board certified. And I still had sort of, I had this desire to learn more about my experience with burnout because it did come back again. And I felt like, it, I felt just scared that this experience of burnout was just gonna be, become this continuous cycle of like, recovering from burnout and then being okay and then burning out again. And I wanted to understand it better. So when it came time to write my thesis, um, I chose to research self-care and burnout in the music therapy profession. And that's when I dug into the existing literature that was there and found that burnout is pretty prevalent in our field. And after working with so many music therapists who have experienced burnout or are going through it, um, it becomes pretty apparent why. I mean, we as music therapists, we enter these very intimate spaces with our clients that can be very emotionally heavy. Our work involves so much empathy and so much compassion. And those things can sometimes be very tiring. At the same time, we're creative people. And a lot of us through our education have been taught to be perfectionists, to play a piece of music perfectly. We're used to aiming toward perfection and we didn't unlearn to sort of let that go when we enter the professional world. And so a lot of us end up sort of trying to reach these unrealistic goals and bringing our perfectionism with us, which also contributes to our experience of burnout. And so, you know, we have these this intense sort of emotional space that we can be in at work. We also can have this high capacity for self-criticism and we have our own, you know, creative personas. And that too can sometimes contribute to the experience of burnout when creativity or for, in our case, music becomes our work and it changes our relationship with the music. And I found that for myself too, where, you know, when I decided to become a music therapist, what was driving me was this deep love for music, or I was, I was, and still am one of those very like obsessed music fans, or I have my bands that I love and I follow them. And like, it's one of those exciting things in life, but sometimes when music becomes work, then it starts to sometimes feel like a burden. Like I'd feel like, you know, I'd come home at the end of the day and not really want to play my guitar for myself after I've been playing all day. Like either my fingers hurt or my voice is tired or, you know, I've just spent a lot of time with music during the day at work. And then I just am not that interested in it in myself. And so all these different elements can sort of contribute to our experience of burnout. And to me, that was so fascinating to explore for my own process but then I realized music therapists need support with this because when I know when I was going through burnout there just wasn't a lot of support available to help me understand what I was experiencing and um, I thought after I've done all of this research I didn't I didn't want music therapists who are going through their burnout experience to experience it alone or figure it out all by themselves like like I had to. And so with my thesis, I ended up self-publishing it as um, an ebook. It's called Resilience Over Burnout, a self-care guide for music therapists. And that ended up opening a few doors for me very unexpectedly. At the time I was running a private practice in California, I was specializing in mental health and addictions treatment. But um, very slowly after I 
released my um, my ebook, I started getting contacted by music therapists who read my book and who were looking for more support with burnout. So I started taking on other music therapists as my clients. And slowly over time, my clientele shifted from my music therapy clients to other music therapists being, being my clients who I was helping. And so that um, sort of unfolded this path of you know, being a person who became more of um, an expert in burnout prevention and stress management. And so that led me to founding the Self Care Institute, where now my focus is helping other professionals through this experience. And um, that in itself has been both very rewarding. And at the same time, you know, over the past year, where stress and burnout, like stress and burnout were big issues before this pandemic started. And now it's something that has intensified, but it has brought self-care to a point where it's like, we cannot ignore this anymore. And so that's one of the good things that has come out of it. But as far as, you know, my path through supporting others with self-care and founding the Self-Care Institute, it did come through my own experiences, but also, following just the needs of my community and seeing what were the holes there that need to be filled and, you know, trying to be the one to step up to fulfill some of these needs as best that I could. Yeah. And that's fantastic. And such a wonderful service to the community and to the music therapists across the globe. And especially now, like you mentioned, you know, that's, it's, there's so much more career burnout and career stress as people are dealing with the changes in our world. Yes. Yeah. And it's now it's not just occupational burnout that's an issue, but we have um, parental burnout. There's also academic burnout. Right now, it's a hard time for students, too, and especially music therapy students. I really felt for music therapy students who are sort of towards um, their ends of their academic path um, during COVID where things got disruptive. But a lot of students will burn out. A lot of students will also burn out in their internship, and I've worked with students that way, too. But there's also something called activist burnout, which is really important right now for anyone who considers themselves, especially with social justice activism, where activist burnout is one reason why sometimes social movements will fail because of the burnout of the activists. And sometimes this can all blend together where occupational burnout and activist burnout and parental burnout and you know, academic burnout, there's a lot of overlap um, in people's individual lives. But um, it is important to know that burnout can exist in a lot of different ways. And right now at this point, you know, in the world, that there are a lot of different types of burnout that um, that are very huge issues, mm-hmm. very big human issues. And, you know, obviously you work a lot with music therapists, but if you had mm-hmm. one self-care tip that could apply to anyone, what do you think that would be? Yeah, well, that would be sort of, and this is, might be very broad, but it's the willingness to look inside of yourself and to to do that with curiosity rather than criticism. That self-care at its core does require honest self-reflection. Because a lot of times with self-care, the the attention is given to behavior. Like what do we do for self-care? We need to sleep you know, eight hours or eat well and hydrate and exercise and like doing, 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 or already doing so much. But, you know, what does drive our behavior are the beliefs we have about us, about ourselves, our self-esteem or our ideas around self-worth or how we're feeling on any given day. And so when self-care means an act of looking inside of ourselves and seeing, you know, what is driving our behavior or, you know, what's behind the decisions that we make or, you know, why would we be unkind to ourselves or choose to be compassionate to ourselves in any given moment. That going inward process is very necessary when we're looking at self-care. And that's where I think that word self and self-care often gets misunderstood. We think, oh, it's all about ourselves or become selfish or it's all about me. But to me, the self and self-care means the self, the true self, of going deep within and seeing what's the self 
that's at the core of you and looking at that in an honest and compassionate way. But it's not always easy. It's not easy to face our feelings. It's not easy to tolerate our own emotions. It's also not easy to face what might be under there, some of those more difficult beliefs we might have about ourselves. But it is often necessary to face those things and uncover it. But um, yeah, it can be hard, especially it can be difficult to do all by ourselves. And um, you know, self-care, although it's just, again the word self can be misleading, self-care is not something you have to do all by yourself. I also recommend community care and you know, connecting your self-care with someone else's or having someone support you in your self-care because it can be so hard to see things about ourselves sometimes and um, having someone support you in that and holding like a, a safe and reflective space can really help accelerate someone's self-care growth. Yeah, that's excellent advice and such wonderful things to think about, especially nowadays. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But again, yeah, not easy to look within and to be gentle with ourselves when we do it. Doesn't mean we doesn't mean we have to go rush inside ourselves and pull out all our feelings and then, you know, express it all out at one time. It is a process, mm-hmm. and you know, it's it's going to be a process for the rest of our lives. And one thing I do like to um, just remind people about is that. Our goal with self-care is never to have it perfect. We're not aiming for like this perfect self-care where we're perfectly balanced every day and then life is going to be good. But life is going to keep changing. Every day we're getting a bit older and self-care will change through the rest of our lives. And the rest of our lives will be an exploration into the question of, you know, what, what do I need right now? What is good for me? What does it mean to be compassionate to myself? And that will keep changing. What is one of the biggest pleasant surprises that you've had in this last year? And it could be from your business or personal life, whatever you'd like to share. One of the biggest surprises was, I guess, or I guess I'll start with one of my biggest fears when the pandemic started, when I saw stress just becoming very elevated very quickly, was I was afraid that self-care would just really get pushed aside and that people would really just start ignoring it and stress would sort of take over. But it was surprising to me how instead self-care became embraced and by many different um, communities and people in different ways. And, you know, the word self-care isn't always used, but we can look at self-care as being self-empowerment or I've seen a lot of people, especially either marginalized people or people who weren't necessarily having a voice or using their voice or felt suppressed or oppressed in some way. I've been just hearing more people's voices over the past year and sometimes speaking about self-care or just speaking as an act of self-care. And to be able to hear that over the buzz of like the stress, the trauma or the drama and the you know, all that's going on in the world. But yet, at the same time, so many voices are being elevated right now. And that was just a wonderful surprise to, to witness and to be a part of. That's really great. Yeah. Not to get maudlin, but what was one of the biggest challenges that you've had in the last year? For me personally, one of the biggest challenges was struggling with my own work, where it, be- it became harder for me to take care of myself during a time or like I've never been through a pandemic in my lifetime. And then I suddenly felt the responsibility to help people deal with their stress through something that I myself had never been in. So for example, like I feel like I'm pretty good or I'm good at helping people through burnout because I've been through it before. And it doesn't mean we've had the exact same, I've had the same experience as someone else. But having gone through burnout, I felt there is a certain degree of empathy or understanding that I can have with someone who is experiencing burnout right now. But if, you know, someone coming to me having um, a lot of stress due to the pandemic, I feel like I'm right there with them. And so it's kind of hard for me to either see something in retrospect to help them through it, but it's like, we're kind of working through this together and I can use my knowledge and wisdom I have of stress management or burnout prevention and try to apply that in the moment through, through a pandemic. But again, trying to navigate 
a very intense and stressful situation myself while trying to help others navigate it too has been a challenge. But at the same time, that does open an opportunity for me to connect with others and to um, use my own struggles as a way to be connected with others rather than isolating myself. And, you know, sometimes I do wish that I had the answers of, you know, how do we get through this pandemic and still have our self-care and deal with our stress? And I wish I could give these clear answers instead of like, feel like I'm just trudging through the mud with everybody else. But yet that trudging through the mud is where I'm learning and is a necessary part of this process too. And part of the building empathy again, so I can help people. But yeah, but not easy. Yeah, it's definitely a difficult task, but, you know, very rewarding and, you know, coming out essentially light at the end of the other side of the tunnel when yeah. someone is being able to return to work as a music therapist mm-hmm. with more hope and more confidence, you know? Yes. Yeah. I've, I've seen firsthand, you know, other colleagues feel burnout and it's just, it's mm-hmm. heartbreaking because what can you do sometimes? Yeah. And it really does vary by people's individual experience. And I guess the hard part about burnout, and especially yeah, seeing it in other people, is that it can be hard to do something about it right away. Like burnout's not something you just lift off of somebody and then it's gone. It's like, it's not something we just cure right away. And it's a lot different than stress. Like with stress, you can point to a stressor and like, if we can deal with that stressor and sometimes that can take the stress away kind of quickly or find some coping skills around it. But burnout is a little bit more of this ambiguous experience that can be cumulative and that in that way, a little more difficult to understand and diff- more difficult to help people through. Yeah. We're going to switch gears a little bit and get to know you a little more. If you had to pick one music record or CD to take with you to like a desert island, uh, what what would that be? That would be, it'd be the album, The Color and the Shape by the Foo Fighters. It's my favorite album of all time. It's one of those albums, like, it just feels like one long song to me. I mean, there are certain favorite songs I have in there, but um, yeah, that would be the album I could take and just listen to it forever. I still haven't gotten tired of it after like 20 years. That's really great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's nice when you discover bands and albums where you can listen to them over and over and it's always fresh and exciting. Yes, yes. And then it it's fun to even have the same music start to mean something else. Like I remember listening to that when I was like in college or towards the end of college and like, you know, being in that time of my life and then now being here and now being able to remember other times I've listened to it. But even now those songs still carrying meaning and weight and almost having like this like special place in my heart where, where it can um, not just be soothing and motivating, but like, feel like I, it's a friend that I can turn to when I need it. Cause it's like, we've gotten to know each other pretty well after all these years, but yeah, if you can feel like a companion. Nice. If you could do any other creative pursuit other than what you already do, what would that be? For me, that would be some type of visual art. I would probably pursue something like painting. I mean, as a musician, I love being a musician. The thing is like, we, Music is such, I mean, obviously it's an auditory experience, but it's also not exactly tangible. And like you play a song, when you play a song, like then it's over. The experience is in the moment, in time. But something like painting, like I sometimes feel jealous of like visual artists where like you have an end product that you can see and it's there and you can like hang it all on a wall and look at it as, and I know you could like listen to a music recording, but again, when the recording's done, like then you're not listening to it anymore, but something that can be like sort of a constant in a space that can hold that kind of a constant energy to me just um, feels appealing after all these years of, you know, playing music. And I know part of the beauty is music keeping us in the moment, but um, yeah, I would love to pursue some type of visual arts. Actually, I was a painter when I was um, 
were really young. I took、um, Chinese watercolor painting when I was probably like between like ages ten and thirteen, and I'm looking at one on the wall right now. It's like pretty good. I was like, can I paint it when I was twelve? Like I could not do that right now. But yeah, visual art would be would be something I'd want to do. Very nice. One final question, and this is sort of a big one: is what does it mean, in your own words, to live a creative life? So a few words come to mind as far as living a creative life, and that is authenticity, freedom, and curiosity. And a creative life—it is a type of life I aspire to continue to live. And to me, that means on a day-to-day -day basis that I can express myself authentically. Meaning, you know, whatever emotions that are there, not only can I express it outwards to other people, but that I can express it to myself and still feel safe. And to me, that's the authenticity that's there. It's like a certain degree of self-acceptance in that authenticity. Also, the word freedom comes to mind, and、um, the way I think about freedom too is like I don't think freedom is just like oh I'm just gonna do whatever I want, whatever I want, do whatever I feel like.、Uh, instead, to me, freedom is the ability to choose what's best for me in any given moment. Because you know, like if I was just doing whatever I want or whatever, like that could be like. Just give you into a craving, or I mean, that could be addiction in some way too. But the ability to really choose in any moment and make a conscious choice about what's best for me is freedom. And when I think about freedom in relation to creativity, when we have that freedom to be able to make conscious and mindful choices in creativity, rather than things either out of our control or not. Choosing what's best for us, or like for example, it can come up so much in creativity, and this happens to me all the time. Is that critical voice coming in and like taking over? Like there's so much room for that in creativity, but I think to live a creative life, we do need the freedom to be able to make choices, not just in what we're doing too, but in what we're thinking, especially about ourselves. And that freedom piece feels important to me in in living a creative life. And of course, to be able to pursue a future where we do have choices, where we have the freedom to make certain choices、um, based on opportunities being available. And and then also this idea of you know creativity. I mean, to me, just some of the best. Songs or best music out there. It's it's those songs where you you can just feel the honesty in it. There's a rawness, and to me, creativity does require honesty. But kind of like I was saying at the beginning, you know, we're talking about self care. You know, looking inside and even being honest with ourselves. It's not easy thing to do. That you know, that can be one of the hardest parts about living a creative life is. Um, consistently being honest with ourselves and with other people, because sometimes it can be easier not to to either deny something or numb out or whatever, but to feel our feelings and allow ourselves to be a human being is part of that honesty process. And to me, that's an important piece also in living a creative life. And、um, And yeah, and that word curiosity.、Um, one of my favorite books is Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert, and it's a book about creativity. But she really em emphasizes the word curiosity, and you know, as we go through life, being curious about certain things rather than being critical or like putting so much pressure on ourselves to like find a passion and like you know figure out the answers and do this or that. But what if? We chose something a little bit lighter, and you know when we can pair curiosity along with trying to be honest and exercising our freedom, and trying to be authentic. Sometimes those things can be kind of heavy, but when we can infuse curiosity into those things, then it can、um, it can be a little bit easier to be creative. I like that, and and such a wonderful deep thoughts that you brought up about that, and you know another thing that. Comes to mind for me is vulnerability plays into all of、yes. the things that you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you brought that word up. Yeah, vulnerability is a big part of all of that. Yeah, 
Excellent. Well, anything else you would like to share with the audience before we sign off? Um, just one of my favorite quotes from Jack Cornfields is, you know, if your compassion does not include yourself, then it's incomplete that I'm sure I'm sure most, if not all of your listeners are very compassionate and giving people. And I, may, I bet a lot of your listeners might identify as being helpers and being compassionate. And that's a beautiful thing. It's so important for us to be compassionate with each other, especially right now. But if your compassion does not also include yourself, then the compassion you give to others is not complete that our compassion does need to involve ourselves. It does need to be directed inward too. And when it is, we will have more compassion to give to others. And when we give compassion to ourselves, we are contributing to the compassion and the love and the kindness that's in this world. And again, every day this world could, could use that. Yes, yes. Excellent. Yeah. Wonderful. That's a wonderful quote. I had not heard that before, but mm -hmm. I, I love that. And it really resonates. Excellent. Well, listeners, if you would like to learn more about music therapy or about Ami Kunimura and what she provides for music therapists regarding burnout, please check the show notes for links. Thanks so much and keep listening. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Like the show? Have a question? stop by the Facebook and Instagram pages. Links are in the show notes or search for a creative piecemeal podcast on social media and click follow for all the latest.